Welcome, everyone. We'll just take a couple of minutes to let people get settled, check their audio and visual. This being the second toll work group meeting. Appreciate all of your time. Scott, I have uh, 5.30. What do you got as far as time? Exactly 5.30. All right. I know that we don't have everyone present, but why don't we uh, go ahead and start? We always seem to run out of time. We try to put a lot of things into a small amount of time. Well, welcome uh, for all of those of you who are panelists and all of you who are attending. We appreciate very much your time tonight. I'm Roy, Roy Rogers. Uh, I, I chair the act and uh, Paul Savas, I see his smiling face, he's, he's your vice chair. Uh, we probably will dispense with, uh, as usual, with, with introductions because most of us are getting to know each other by now. And I would simply uh, tell you that the agenda is really uh, with uh, Lucinda and Scott. I don't see Lucinda yet on the screen, but Scott's there. Uh, and he's going to go through with a, a presentation We'll have some public comment at the end and hopefully get you out by seven o'clock so you can get back to doing all the things I know that you have to do. So, um, Scott, uh, can I turn it over to you at this point or do you want to wait for Lucinda? Uh, yes, thank you for the introductions, Chair Rogers. I think we're ready to go. We've got a few minutes after the hour and it looks like by my count about 45 total in attendance. Um, Maybe Two I, things, Scott. Well, one, uh, I see Markley has their uh, hand, his hands up. And then if there are anybody who um, is a part of the uh, toll work group who is on the attendee side because you didn't get the link for the, go ahead and raise your hand and, and Nick um, and myself and Scott will help move you over. Um, so I see, yeah, three people, Tom, Kristen and Ray and Lucinda are all on the attendee side, Nick. So if you want to bring them over and then Markley, is that what you were going to comment about? Or did you have another comment? No, thank you. Uh, that was a mistake. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. And then I see Mary Nolan as well, Nick. So if we just want to wait 30 seconds, I think we'll get those folks in and then we can get rolling. I appreciate that uh, clarification. So yeah, no get, problem. The, get the panelists squared up, those that can uh, speak and participate. And we do have the, the general public in attendance and we'll have time um, later in the agenda for public comment. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome. Well, I think that is all the folks in the attendees who needed to be pulled over and I see Lucinda there. So yeah, Lucinda, Scott, go ahead and kick us off. Oh, good evening. Thank you for joining us for the second Region 1 Act Plus meeting. Um, I think it's going to be a powerful meeting this evening. We have lots of, um, we have your questions from last time. We want to address some of those, actually have some dialogue. So I'm going to let Scott facilitate and Garrett and I are here to help out. Thank you so much, Lucinda, and thank all of you for your time tonight. Uh, as Lucinda mentioned, uh, we are, we've got a running start. This is our second meeting. We'll be meeting every other month uh, for four more meetings, sort of taking on the original questions that you posed over 30 of those. But first, just a quick note on purpose. Again, this is the R1 Act, plus our partners in leadership in Southwest Washington. And the toll work group is really a forum for discussion about your key toll program questions. And what you'll see tonight is we'll, we'll put those questions up. We'll have some brief initial responses from ODOT team staff, and then we'll have a rounded discussion. And we've sort of organized these uh, in sets of three subtopics. The primary topic tonight are toll program questions. Uh, appreciate your feedback from the first meeting. We uh, cleared up some of the technical issues 
from the uh, first webinar. And um, we'll again look for feedback tomorrow. So to kick things off, one of the great meetings uh, within the uh, meeting ideas within the membership was the elevator pitch. And so uh, we plan to do this as sort of the, uh, the kickoff item on each of the coming four agendas. And what we'll do is ask for you to raise your hand and come off mute to give a 20 or 30 second pitch or so. It depends on the height of your building. But the idea is whether you're in an elevator on the street with uh, your constituents, um, folks in the community, you'll have a different audience um, to talk about uh, what sort of response you might give uh, to that particular audience. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Garrett first to kick things off tonight. So as we sort of open, we wanted to pick a general audience uh, within um, our, our commuter group, folks that would be interested and concerned about tolling. So we're asking today, what would you say about congestion pricing to a Northeast Portland commuter? Garrett? Well, I'll do my best uh, Mayor Sherado impression. Thank you for the question. And um, imagine we're on uh, the big pink and, and headed up 40 floors. Um, so give me about 45 seconds to make your way through this. Um, so highway gridlock in Portland is growing day by day. We know that when the highways back up, neighborhoods bear the climate, health, and safety burden with more cars and trucks on local streets. We like you are concerned about this impact. May sound odd, but the best way to deal with this is through tolling, or to be more specific, a certain type of tolling called congestion pricing. Congestion pricing the highways will give people who use them a more reliable trip and time back in their day. Neighborhoods will benefit by keeping those trips on the highway. We want to see you make it to your medical appointment, daycare pickup, and job on time. You will experience a direct benefit from tolling by investments that make our roads safer, strengthen our economy, protect community health, and make travel more affordable and easier, whether you decide to walk, ride, bike, or drive. We know this is gonna be a big change and we're studying how to do this best. Come help us figure it out. Oh, floor 36, that's where I'm at. Have a good day. Very good. So the idea here is to get some more elevator pitch uh, ideas on how you might respond today. Do we have a, another toll member who would like to address this question? Looking for any hands up or coming off mute now. Or I know even, for, yeah, even feedback on what resonated with you or what, what didn't, any areas for improvement. While you're thinking about that, I know my first opportunity was in a car um, heading down to uh, a football game when the Ducks and the Beavers were both playing. And of course, my associate thought uh, it would be nice to be able to uh, relieve some congestion through a toll program, but uh, haven't prepared my speech. We've got a hand up, uh, Councilor Nolan. Thanks, Scott. And these are my constituents. I represent almost all of Northeast Portland on the Metro Council. And um, my pitch is that we pay for what we value. And sometimes we pay for it directly because there's a price tag at the checkout when we go to a retail store or a grocery store. Sometimes we pay for it indirectly with the amount of time or pollution that is caused by convenience or um, something that is beneficial for one person but not for the whole community. We want to run the transportation system to the best interests of everyone for the next 20 to 30 to 40 years, thinking beyond personal convenience and into community benefits. The way to do that is make sure that we provide a ser service that is valuable, convenient, safe, and those who benefit the most from it especially at its most congested times, pay a little more to get someplace fast or without disruption. That's what we're talking about. And we invite the entire community to help us shape a plan that will improve our climate stewardship, improve the safety of our highways and something we can all live with for the next 40 years. 
Thanks very much. I appreciate that broad uh, community input perspective on that. We appreciate all of the input that you might have. It's like, uh, if I'm not out of order on the hands up, uh, Peter Truax, would you like to give a comment or an elevator pitch? Thank you very much. In Forest Grove, the aspect of congestion pricing may not seem overly important, but in the final analysis, those of us on the edge will obviously benefit through cleaner air, more attention to alternate transportation forms, and being part of the larger family. Congestion pricing will help all of us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This is the way we'd like to start the meetings, having these discussions and, and going uh, further down uh, the path on each one of these. So any other elevator pitch ideas for the Northeast Portland commuter? I see uh, Zach Culver's hand up. Yeah, so I would just like to, you know, I guess a couple of talking points that really resonate with me and, and probably the union membership that I, re, you know, represent is that reliable commute time, right? Because, you know, we're having to leave and, and just in the outlying areas when you're coming into Portland to work and there's a lot of work in the Portland metro area and then, and then workers commuting from Gresham, say, to a large facility out in Intel or Nike to, to work. They don't have a reliable commute in the evening to get home to their families and, and that time is invaluable you know to to spend that family time you know some of these commutes are an hour in the morning and an hour and a half to two hours at night and if they can get some of that time back with their families it's really going to be valuable and worth the the expense and you know the safe safety that mary nolan um mentioned that is so important and also the impact on the climate for years to come so uh, really appreciate all those talking points and or things we could share thank you well said zach and i think we've all gotten used to it. those of us who've had some more time at home uh the, the benefits of having that time back another way to do it uh it looks like uh chair rogers your hands up Sure, thank you. Ashton as well, Scott, after that. Oh, thank you. Yep. Ashton may have been up sooner. Were you up sooner than I? You could have been. I'll yeah, defer to you. Ashton, go. <laughs> no, go ahead, Chair Byers. Chair Rogers, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Okay. I, well, I, I would say two things. One, first to ODOT, thank you for uh, going through the exercise. It's exactly what we chatted about at our board meeting, that uh, there has to be something crisp. Uh, I haven't designed it because I don't know all the benefits to Washington County. And I, I heard Pete talk a bit about the trends, but we're still measuring what, uh, what this value is and how we crisply say it. But I would say that the audience is much broader than the one that you just mentioned, Northeast Portland or Washington County or, or even this region. We're going to have to convince two senators and five congressmen. That, that's just on this side of the river, not counting the Washington side that there's some value to all of this. So as you go about this exercise, I hope your, your, your conversation is broader and say, why is this important to somebody in Hermiston or Medford or anywhere in between? I mean, all over the state. So I, I'm hoping to broaden it to say that this has benefit. I, I haven't heard that yet. Heard a lot about the region. I think we have to say something about the state as well as the bi-state. So that's my comment. Thank you for those. And um, why don't we take uh, Ashton's uh, elevator pitch and, and one more and move on in the agenda. Ashton. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I really want to echo uh, exactly what Councillor Nolan put forward uh, in terms of making sure we take care of our most vulnerable users when we do this. Uh, a lot of great points were brought up, but for me, uh, leading with climate, uh, the goal should be to change behaviors uh, and change our culture of driving. Uh, and this is also a way of doing that uh, by also um, providing more uh, transit options, transportation options and, and multimodal options so that folks uh, do have alternative options of moving around uh, that will help us align with our climate goals and reduce greenhouse gas emissions that we're pumping into the air, whether idling or not idling. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. A lot of a lot of good ideas about uh, why this makes some sense and how you might convey that to your neighbor, your community, your constituents. Um, let's take one more if we have a hand up or somebody that would like to address the Northeast Portland commuter about congestion pricing. If none, then we can go ahead and move on with our agenda. Thank you so much. I think it was very interesting. Really helped us to look at how we convey what we're talking about with congestion pricing. So I did mention that uh, we've come through with the first kind of topic area of the 30 plus questions that you posed. Um, we've provided uh, four separate agendas every other month. We'll start with the program elements. And what we'd like to do is just uh, go through kind of groups of three questions. We put these under the subtitles, uh, program elements, program engagement, and program implementation. And we'll just give you some initial feedback from the staff perspective. And to be able to get through three groups of three in 45 minutes, we've got three kind of uh, subgroup discussion points on the agenda. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in if we can, Nick. So from uh, Commissioner Rogers, how does this benefit Washington County? We'll just kick off with a couple of uh, initial responses, Garrett, if you could lead on what we know. Sure, and, and like you were saying, Scott, this could be Washington County or Clark or Clackamas, um, those counties that really are, are some of the regional workforce where there's a lot of commuting happening. Uh, so close to 50% of Washington County's workers today commute commute into the county each day. Um, and we know that congestion, like Commissioner Rogers, you said, whether it's Hermiston or larger parts throughout the state on I-5 and I-205 in the Portland Metro have local, county, regional, and national impacts to travelers and businesses. Um, you know, I think also in, in one of your, it was kind of a sub question or you also raised in the meeting is really having what's the benefit of, um, if you're gonna charge people on the highways, where is that money going? And so what we know today, we're at least able to answer about the I-205 toll project and that the toll revenues that are needed uh, are gonna be needed to deliver the I-205 improvement project, improvements project in its entirety. Uh, so the phase 1A, uh, which is the Abernathy Bridge, the seismic retrofitting, that's gonna start construction next year, but those other phases, uh, tolling, the dollars from tolling is needed to fully develop and, and build that project out. Next slide. Scott. Thanks so much. And for our second question under program elements, uh, Sumi uh, Malik from HDR asks, how do you define a corridor for investment? Take a stab at that one. Yeah, Last slide go. there, Garrett. It's getting a little... There we go. Well, excellent question, Sumi. Um, so as you can see here on the map, uh, what she's referring to is a uh, a policy decision that was made by the Oregon Transportation Commission in September of 2020. Um, and it, it identified two corridors. The corridor in purple uh, is the I-5 and the corridor in green, the I-205. And total revenues that uh, will be spent in the corridor in which they're collected. Now we do need, need to do more work to help define that corridor. Uh, some places in the United States set a, a sp specific limit, like a half a mile from the highway Others just identify the counties that are around the highway and make those available for, um, for toll investment. Um, and then a third way it's done is by looking at the impact of the project, really kind of following what's studied in NEPA and using that as a geographic kind of determinant for uh, where toll dollars are invested. Uh, we also know for this region, Portland, uh, the Metro has a, a, a definition for corridor as well. Uh, so if those four options, those will be on the table as far as how it gets defined um, and, and if there are other ideas as well. Um, and I would say the timing on when we'll address this, uh, we have a regional transportation plan and Oregon transportation plan updates that are going on in the next few years. Um, and so we'll, we'll help define this question more as those, pro as those processes move along as well. Next slide. Very good. And... Um... For Mayor Calloway at Hillsborough, after implementation, what happens if the promised improved mobility does not meet modeled outcomes? All right, excellent question, Mayor Calloway. Uh, so we know um, from a, 
uh, we will study a range of mobility performance measures in the NEPA or environmental review process. Uh, there's a document called Performance Measures that's out there now on our website. We've been working on with our equity committee uh, to really help deepen and inform that and look at it not just from a, a what does the transportation model say, but what does uh, what do people in those impacted areas say as well as what is the impact and then what should be done to address that. Um, and so when the toll rate schedule is adopted, there'll be likely a dashboard of measures that ODOT and the OTC adopt to track and understand uh, mobility uh, impacts on um, any future adjustments to the toll rate schedule. So it's not a set it and forget it um, toll rate, um, but it's one that we'll have uh, set up and we'll, we'll be monitoring and to see if the benefits that we believe congestion pricing will be are actually being achieved. Thank you for that. And so it's really time for the toll work group to, to respond. We're talking a bit about program elements, responding to the questions of the group, uh, everything from who it benefits to how we define the, the corridor and um, a little bit further into project elements. And I wonder if any of those members where we captured your question had any further comments on those or if folks could go ahead and have their particular uh, voices heard on on this topic do we capture the questions do we have more kind of layers of the onion to peel back on these councillor nolan thank you um i can't speak to whether the question was captured because none of those came from me but it seems to me that the answers generally are we really don't know yet we don't say how we're going to define a corridor we say how other places define corridors but we haven't said how will we define a corridor for purposes of where the um tolling revenue might be spent what happens if we don't hit the mark of our modeling? Well, we'll study that later. Um, from Metro's point of view, um, we will be looking for answers to questions like that in advance so that we're not getting, we're not putting ourselves on behalf of our constituents in a place where we approve something and then if it doesn't work, well, sorry guys, we just blew it. Appreciate that comment. I know we've got several folks. Um, let me go ahead and go to uh, Chair Rogers next. If you have several, go ahead and take them. I can come at the end. I'd like to hear what they have to say. I'm just seeing your hand now. I wanted to make sure okay. I include you as well, Lucinda, to see if yeah. you have some perspectives. But if, if you would go, Roy, the uh, did we capture the question? And I know you've earlier yeah. talked about expanding this regional question. Yeah, you, you captured the question well. I, I uh, understood uh, that that's what you do. I'm not sure we still have a clear answer. Um, I think the corridor question that was brought up a moment ago is a good one. Also, if you're going to do improvements in the corridor, uh, what, what kinds of improvements? If they're highway taxes, obviously they need to go into pavement and those kinds of amenities. Then address transit, which we know this is totally lacking in transit in this corridor. So we don't know about that. Uh, I, when it was at our council, I uh, heard the explanation that we need to toll to make improvements. We, you know, it's like maintaining a house. Well, this is different than maintaining a house. This is to use the house that we already have. So th there's a lot of questions. It, it's, um, our business community is not terribly excited. And from the article of Paul you sent out, I'm guessing it's not terribly exciting in some parts of Oregon City as well as other areas. So we, I, I think we need to refine it more. I, I, I'm gonna give you a big A or however I would do that with my fingers. Uh, you, you're certainly attempting, but there's a lot of questions uh, that we, I think need to resolve. So I'll stop at that. I appreciate it. Also, I would just state that we expect the original questions to lead to more questions. So we'll keep recording those. I saw a hand up. Uh, Paul, Paul Savas, are you ready to yeah. go next? Uh, thank you. Um, 
I concur with uh, both uh, Chair Rogers and uh, Councillor Nolan's comments about the responses are, you know, really incomplete or somewhat vague. And I'm not going to blame anyone. Uh, we really don't know. Um, I will say that on the very first question about Northeast Portland, um, I can't speak for Northeast Portland, but I was trying to imagine if I was posed that question for Clackamas County, um, I would probably have a much different response than Councillor Nolan. Um, that is an area that really lacks um, transit options. You've heard me say that before. It lacks alternatives. Um, the, the geography, the topography, um, the, the geographic barriers um, are such that, um, you know, someone on the midway up the hill in West Lynn is not going to have a practical alternative um, coming down um, uh, some, some of their roads, which are awfully steep. Um, you know, same thing in, in Oak Grove where I live. Um, you know, there's parts of Oak Grove that there's just not any safe way to access transit. So I don't, I just don't understand the mechanics of the state of the statement in response to Northeast Portland as it applies to Clackamas in all fairness on mechanically, how does that really work? How is it going to be a benefit if people don't have access to alternatives? And we have not answered that question. That question about how <clears throat> those alternatives are put in place, it, it's, it's just not clear. So um, that's my response at this point. Thank you. No, thanks very much. And I, you raised a really good point. Incomplete, their initial responses and transit and transportation alternatives are um, to come up in March, but we certainly have plenty of work to do. Um, let me see if we have, you know, we're about to transition to the next set of three I don't see Let's another hand, him. Lucinda. I, I, I have my I have my hand oh, up. Oh, there it is. Yes, Tom, please. Uh, so real quick, and to to mirror uh, Savas's point, that's the piece: is how is ODOT working with the other jurisdictional partners to provide more options before we roll this out? Like, are you a part of those conversations, and are you you know really listening and 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 diving deep into the community engagement aspect of this to make sure? You know, we are also looking at some of the barriers that folks do have in terms of getting to transit, in terms of accessibility and affordability. Uh, I, I'm right there with it. Like, until you provide those options, it's going to be a hard sell for folks. Thank you, Ashton. And apologies for getting getting out of order on, on that uh, call. Tom, did I have you next or was that yeah. uh, now Dr. Tom and then Dr. Wu, please? I, I appreciate the, the last four people who spoke, um, beginning with Mary Nolan, I think, then Roy, then Paul and Ashton. Um, transit, I work, for a, I work for a big bus company called TriMet, and we are very supportive of these projects, but we are concerned and question how we're going to actually pay for this service because, you know, there are constitutional prohibit, 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 we're prohibited by the Constitution for taking tolling money and uh, giving it to operations for a transit district. And uh, we need to start having those discussions loud and long about this because we need to solve that problem soon. We need to start addressing it because if we don't address it, I'm worried that we're gonna have a project and no way to really have that transit solution hand in hand with the uh, tolling project. Well said, thank you, Tom. I think we'll go to uh... We're going to go to Pia Welsh and then Dr. Wu, and then I think we'll transition. Lucinda, if you have thoughts on this before we transition to the next three, you could go third. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to touch base on what Commissioner Savis brought up because I think it also applies to industrial areas that we have throughout the city and the county that um, there aren't always facilities. Um, and there certainly is very little transportation options, if no options, for those areas. So I think at some point in time, when we look at these projects, we can't have these projects being built in isolation. We have to look at how they connect to areas and who's going to benefit. Because if we spend a lot of money, and um, there might be a benefit for a few, but there may not be the best benefit can get out of the project. And I think one of the areas that's historically not looked at and that not a lot of attention is paid to are industrial areas and how people get to their family wage jobs. 
Good. So remember the connectivity to employment and industrial areas. Thank you for that. Dr. Wu, you've had your hand up. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I just wanted to follow up on Ashton's uh, comment. And, and that is to say that at least within EMAC, and Garrett can follow up on this if, if, if he feels it's appropriate, that within EMAC, you know, we've been drafting some foundational statements uh, which are intended to reflect uh, sort of the conceptual high level thoughts uh, from that committee. And one of those foundational statements is the importance of ODOT working with jurisdictional partners on this whole project. Uh, and so that is a very key element of what's coming out of EMAC as well. So I thought I would just provide that little bit of clarification. Very good. Lucinda, Scott, any words to throw in there, or Garrett, before we move to the next three? Yeah, I was going to throw in a few words, but Lucinda, I'll, I'll defer to you. Go ahead, because I think you're going to roll off of Dr. Wu, so keep it in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I can definitely tell, and, and to, for the most part, I wish we had a better answer with a more specific list of improvements and projects for you. Um, we're starting this discussion, I think, earlier than any other congestion pricing NEPA project has done it in the country. Um, San Francisco, they've got some projects now where they're talking about equity and in these investments at the forefront. Uh, but, but the Seattle projects like the SR520 bridge, um, they really didn't look into the start the transit conversations until after NEPA that, that it was identified as an impact. And so um, we, are, uh, we have a bi-monthly uh, work group with all the transit providers in the region uh, that we've been meeting it with for the past year. Uh, to try to identify those investments and better understand uh, how that meets with, with their needs. I know Andy, who's here, is, is on the call as well with TriMet, uh, has been a part of that. Um, and then additionally, with the regional modeling group, our, our representatives from agencies throughout the region, um, and we're looking to better understand from the NEPA work, how, what are those impacts and benefits to getting people to the regional job centers that Pia mentioned, uh, or the impacts to people's budgets or their time. So um, I'm, sa I'm sorry that we can just like point to a process question, but that's just us being transparent about where we're at, about what's been committed to and, and what comes next. Uh, Lucinda? So no, thanks, I appreciate that. I, I think what, what we're trying to drive here is you do have a lot of questions. Some of those questions get answered like way down the road when we're implementing we're really trying to dig through and making sure we're asking all the right questions. You know, is EMAC addressing all the equity measures that you believe that are out there? I mean, they have some foundational, some key statements, which I think we'll send um, to this group. We can send those to this group so you can see what they're working on. We plan on getting those out to the public to make sure that the folks that they represent agree with those are the things that we need to be working on and we're working towards. So I, I would say that we're not, we haven't answered all of your questions. We're taking your questions. When we come back next time, you'll notice we'll go a little bit deeper. And that's the ideal of a workshop, right? We understand that our, we're at the beginning stages trying to explain something that's happening down the road, but we wanna make sure that we open the door now. So thank you. And Scott, you can move to this. So what we did was we, we grouped these. We'll go through those questions, those answers, and then have this dialogue yet again. Go for it, Scott, thank you. Thank you all for this uh, productive discussion. So the second uh, group of three, and we're just a few minutes behind on the schedule, I think we'll catch up, are the program engagement questions. Let's jump right in, Nick. Uh, Mayor Snyder Tigard asks, what is the ODOT OTC communications plan for the general public? Definitely excellent. Uh a uh, question, uh, Mayor Snyder, um, and we know that change is tough uh, and this is gonna be big. And so congestion pricing and tolling existing roads is gonna be new to Oregonians. Um, we've got a communications and equitable engagement plan we've been conducting for our toll projects. Um, that includes a full tiering down of interaction in groups like with yourselves, uh, but also uh, ODOT directly investing in community-based organizations to team with us to help spread that message. Um, and then we've been investing for a little over a year now in community engagement liaisons uh, that are people within communities and our equity communities that are some are, are hardest to reach uh, to continue to spread that word. Um, we know though that this is, you know, we're just kind of setting ourselves up for, for like when Lucinda said, when we do have toll rates and, and that's more specific, 
uh, we're going to see a whole nother level of engagement um, and, and feedback there. And so we know that we're kind of preparing for that time. And let me just add, can we go right back? I just want to add something to that. So our, our equitable engagement plan has been brought to our EMAC, our Equity Mobility Advisory Committee, so they can help us craft what that is. So we're not going out with what we know, we're going out with some information from people who are doing that work. So it's a little bit deeper on that equitable engagement than I've seen previously anywhere. And we're making sure we dig in and actually incorporate those things that they identify. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Lucinda. Okay, thank you both. Um, Carly Francis, our WASDOT Regional Administrator asked, how is formal input, R1 Act, JPACT, et cetera, and informal input such as to work group input taken into account. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the question, Administrator Francis. Um, we know this is a complex process with decisions at the federal, state, and regional level. Um, and, and I definitely know it's a hard part of my job, but it's the, our best to make it coordinated and clear to understand about where these decisions are being made and when. Um, input from the Region 1 Act and JPAC will be included in a, in a process of bringing key decisions to the OTC. Uh, probably include Metro Council there as well as the regional MPO. Um, and then I wanted to highlight two specific decision-making bodies, the Oregon Transportation Commission and then JPAC and Metro Council. Um, Oregon Transportation Commission is the authorized toll, uh, toll rate setting authority for Oregon. Um, and so they're really the decision makers for the establishing the toll program, uh, collection, enforcement, the rules around that. Uh, they're also, uh, they'll, they'll be the decision makers on uh, the policies that exist at the Oregon Transportation Plan and Oregon Highway Plan levels. Um, again, there's a process right now uh, that's undergoing uh, that's similar to the Regional Transportation Plan update, the 2023 process that Metro is working on. Uh, so I think uh, we benefit in the sense that we have both of these happening at the same time and we can really coordinate congestion pricing and toll policy development in the region and in the state. Um, and then they'll also be as the projects move through the toll rate setting authority. Uh, for JPACT and Metro Council, uh, there are Metropolitan Planning Organization designated for the region. Um, and so they'll, uh, so we will need amendments to the regional transportation plan. And then as our projects progress along, we will need MTIP, that's the funding part of it, the Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Plan amendments. Um, we'll also need, like I talked about before, in that policy development process amendments through there. Uh, we currently have an RTP amendment we need uh, for the I-205 toll project. Um, and that amendment really lets us uh, start to program the money to research the answers uh, around diversion um, and impacts that we hear a lot of concerns about. We kind of need the money to start that work. And then we're expecting the, the larger, the regional mobility pricing project um, that project, that amendment is probably going to align well with Metro's process for the 2023 update, uh, which they're doing like a call for projects late next summer of next year. Next slide. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Commissioner uh, Savas of Clackamas County asks, are we gathering information about how tolls work to bring to the OTC? And then uh, I saw Lucinda, you, you want me to do this, Lucinda, and then I'll have you add on before we go to discussion. Okay, cool. Um, yes, so uh, like we had talked about in the previous question, in addition to the, uh, our equity committee, the EMAC, um, they helped us craft uh, what you see here on the screen, which is an equity framework. Um, and what it does, it's changing the way ODOT does business uh, by making decision-making a much more iterative process. Um, and so uh, as you can see here, uh, we're uh, identifying when we're using the term equity, we're being very clear about who, where, and when that is. Uh, we're using performance measures to understand how should we study those impacts and burdens, benefits and burdens. Um, with that information comes to the group, determining benefits and burdens, and then we choose options that advance equity, and we send it back through that same process to help refine those. Next slide. Um, one of the key parts that our, our, our EMAC and we've been in working through with the transit multimodal work group, that regional group of transit providers, are uh, looking at research uh, from around uh, 10 different other projects in the United States. And what did congestion pricing or tolling do for transit multimodal investments? 
What did they do to impact diversion or to address diversion, health and safety and affordability? Uh, so we have research documents on each one of those that make it pretty clear and concise and easy to see uh, what others have done to address those on their uh, projects. And we're using that to help inform uh, the decision-making process as it goes up to the OTC. Next slide. Uh, so Lucinda, you want to add, I think, something onto the second question. I, I do, but that was on to Carly's question. Mm -hmm. I think it was Carly's question. We talked about the feds, um, yep. the state, the OTC, who's the uh, tolling authority in Oregon. But we need the Fed approval for the Regional Mobility Pricing Project. So not just the NEPA, we have another step. We need to go to the Secretary of the USDOT to get that signed off because it is congestion pricing and that is that value pricing pilot project that we are a part of and we need to get that we need to get that signed off there so we have a lot of levels or a lot of layers to go through before we even get down to the yes we're ready to toll we need some yeses from the feds for sure very good i think that frames a good break for discussion on the program engagement level you know how do we convey uh what it is from a, from a community and authority level, but also within our communities. Um, I'm just going to go straight to hands, uh, Mayor Snyder. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I just want to make a, a comment related to my question, and there was a fair bit of context in front of my question that didn't appear on the slide, and um, that really referenced how I think wildly unpopular the concept of tolling will be and whether you want to call it congestion pricing or not, or we want to, and that's what we think it is. It's really not going to matter. Um, you know, and I think last year's transportation campaign and measure was a good example of how people that want to oppose things can pretty easily control the narrative with unpopular or popular language that we may think is unfair, but it doesn't really matter. Um, from a campaign perspective. And I guess the reason I'm raising this is I feel like the response to my question was sort of um, wildly out of line with the amount of resource and likely uh, sort of community upheaval that will come out of this work over time. Um, you know, I was trying to think of a good analogy. I mean, this would be like trying to you know, invade Iraq with the, you know, banned kids from Tigard High School. Like, that's literally how I feel, how absurd this is um, when you're thinking about how uh, or, or what I sense the community perspective is going to be. All the engagement tools that you're using are maybe covering 1% of the population, maybe not, maybe even less than that, um, if you're lucky. And I guarantee you about 80% of the people that live in the region are going to have a very strong reaction to this project eventually. So I just feel like it's really under um, sort of, it's not, you're just really under resourced or really under thinking, I think about how big of an issue the question I raised really is. Uh, thank you. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mayor Snyder. And apologies that we sort of um, undersold that, that point that you've made that it is a wildly unpopular initiative and we certainly have had any comments uh, to that effect so uh, let's uh, see if we can take that one more uh, directly I don't know if there are folks that want to tag on I've got uh, Commissioner Savas and uh, Vice Chair Savas and, uh, and, and Chair uh, Rogers lined up next yeah um thank you I want to first of all uh, give my appreciation and thanks to all those that are on the EMAC committee for their hard work I know they've been, made, been meeting frequently and I appreciate that. I was pleased to hear Garrett in, in the response to my question, but getting back to um, um, the mayor's last point he just made, um, if there are solutions and ideas uh, with diversion or the concise ideas, I, I think I would get that out there as soon as possible, even if they're just concepts. I, I would push them out as fast as possible because right now I think a lot of people aren't seeing those. And um, here in Clackamas County, you know, we're, 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 wel we're welcoming any good ideas when it comes to solving some of these problems that would be created by tolling or congestion pricing or dynamic pricing, whatever you wanna call it. 
but we need to hear those answers as soon as possible, even if they are not, you know, approved or authorized, but if they're just concepts, we would love to hear them. So get the ideas out early in terms of the, the conceptual solution. Chair Rogers, did you want to add to this discussion? Yeah, I had a question. I know that you're not going to have an answer, but that's okay. Um, first of all, Jason's point was uh, well taken. I think Paul followed up with that. Uh, the bigger question in my mind has always been, and in fact, Ryan, you and I, if I see you on the screen, uh, and Matt Garrett in his day, we talked about this as well. There's, there's always a bit of confusion when there's efforts going inside this region when you have a, a JPAC or a Metro involvement as well. And uh, as we all know, uh, tolling is under the auspices of the, uh, of the Oregon Transportation Commission, ODOT. Um, but uh, MTIP amendments and uh, our, our TP policies go through JPAC and then through Metro. So hopefully we're going to figure out some way if there is a difference of opinion uh, between these groups, how we're going to resolve that um, in, in a very crass way. Who, who has the trump card? Is it going to be the Transportation Commission that says we're going to do certain things? Or if that's the case, uh, how, how do we deal with MTIP amendments or RTP uh, policy that uh, may be in contrast or not uh, agree entirely? And as I look at the faces around this group, uh, we have very few JPAC representatives here. We have one Metro Councilor, but uh, uh, there, there's some reconciling. So I, I, I think in the communications piece, we need to bring our, our, our fellow partners along pretty well and have a good understanding that we're going to arrive at the same place and not uh, be very far different because if we are, um, this is going to be even a, a sadder, more difficult process than uh, described by what uh, Paul and Jason were saying earlier. So that's my comments. Thanks so much. Uh, Mayor Sherrado. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna tag on a little bit here, tangentially, I guess, to uh, Mayor Snyder's comment and uh, something I heard earlier from Commissioner Savas. Um, I was gonna kind of save these toward the end, but it's, I don't know that there's really an appropriate place. Um, I do appreciate, and I wanna sincerely say that uh, with regard to um, trying to devise or come up with that uh, um, elevator speech, um, because I think that that's going to become an effective or it could be become a very effective tool in having dialogue with, uh, with people in the community. Um, but I wanna just as a piece of guidance, be as, as more encourage you to be as specific as possible with regard to the region. So if, for example, we're talking about the Northeast, um, would you pose the same questions or give the same elevator speech to people who live in the Lloyd district as you would to people who live in uh, Maywood Park, as you would to people who live in Troutdale or Gresham. Um, so I think there needs to be a certain amount of, of um, specificity with regard to where, where the person uh, literally lives, uh, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, um, to get their attention. And getting the attention is, is critically important when you're when you're having this dialogue, for example, if I come up to you and I say, give me your opinion, um, you may or may not have uh, some intention right there. Uh, you may or may not have any interest right there. But if I come up to you and I say, give me your money, I guarantee you, your attention level is going to go way up. Your heartbeat is going to go way up your uh, sense of, of emotionalism is going to go way up. So um, that is part of framing how you have this little, get, get the appropriate attention and responses that you're seeking in your elevator speech. You've got you to say something to somebody that's going to hit their emotional hot button. You can always follow that up intellectually, but you have to get that, that emotional involvement in, uh, and try to turn that into a, obviously a positive reaction as opposed to an emotional reaction. And I think that ties in a little bit with what Mayor Snyder was talking about. Um, also what um, Mayor Savas had referred to is um, I think it's also as, as we develop our, 
our plans going forward and our involvement with the community, we all recognize that we're not all equal in terms of transit opportunities, and we probably never will be. Um, but it is important, I think, that as, as we have our plans develop and what we're going to be presenting to the community members is that um, if there are no particularly public transportation opportunities or alternatives, then you've got kind of a narrower or specific clientele that you're speaking to. If you have a lot of public transportation opportunities, I think that that's another dialogue that's a little bit different. So if I'm talking to, example, for example, um, a person who lives um, in farther out Clackamas County, um, Beaver Creek, I'm gonna just take Beaver Creek, or if I'm talking to um, somebody who lives uh, closer in um, someplace in the neighborhood of, uh, well, let's say Wilson High School in, um, in metropolitan Portland, relatively close to Highway 99. Um, there are two different worlds there in which those people live with regard to what their options are. And I think that those items have to be woven into the fabric of what it is that we're going to present as a final product. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary Serrato. I think it is important and it's part of this engagement uh, category in the program and how we convey. I'm just going to note that we're going to have to give back um, five minutes on the on the third of three in the round. So maybe we can wrap up quickly, uh, Chris, and then Mary. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I just wanted to uh, echo, I think, what, what Roy said in terms of of the engagement and kind of the elected officials and the people that are closer that are going to have to sell this. And we work together on that. I, I know ultimately the OTC is the authority, but certainly without, um, you know, notwithstanding our team, uh, I do think that we as local community are going to have to, um, and as difficult as it may be that some of the mayors have demonstrated, uh, we're going to have to bring our, our, our constituents forward. So um, keeping that in mind in terms of you know, the ultimate authority may be with the OTC, but we really still um, need to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Councillor uh, Nolan, please. Thanks, and I'll also be quick because a lot of the thoughts I wanted to convey have already been conveyed, but I wanted to um, play off of Commissioner Rogers' comments about the different parties here. Um, and I don't know if anyone has um, the final say and can kick the rest of everyone out of the room. I think of it more as a buy or try cameral decision-making process that the OTC has ultimate authority on the tolling program. But as Chris said, and as Commissioner Rogers said, if everybody's not brought along, the program won't be successful. And if the OTC and ODOT think they're gonna proceed over the objections of key players, then we're not getting off on the right foot. I haven't heard that yet, but I wanna make sure that the questions that are being identified as needing more than generic, will let you know when we get their answers, aren't getting answered. There won't be support from the groups that need to um, endorse this. Um, Metro Council wants to be a regional partner and a collaborative um, entity, and we need to have answers to our questions before we say, yep, we're on board. Well said. So it's a partnership with many steps. Lucinda, did you want to um, have a word on this before we go to the next topic? No, I think that, that that is what we are trying to foster here, actually, in this early engagement ideal of engaging you long before we get the project kind of set in stone. These are the early stages. We are we are actually inviting you in to start talking this through and making you, you know, hoping that you feel like that you're a partner with us and that we are asking that you partner with us to make this happen. So thank you. Very good. So program implementation, a couple of questions here and we'll have a discussion. Uh, Councilor Nolan of uh, Metro asked how does ODOT decide how to make 
a recommendation about which authority to toll under. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Nolan. Uh, we'll need to complete the environmental review or NEPA process and seek federal approval before it's decided uh, which federal program we would go under. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there are two main federal programs. There's the section 129, which is, you can think of that or your more traditional like bridge replacement toll goes on there to pay for that. Um, and then there's the value pricing pilot program, which we have a slot under with the U US Department of Transportation. Um, for either of these programs, whether it's section 129 or VPPP, if you're paying for capital improvements, if you're going out and bonding and paying for those, uh, those projects and how money flows out of toll revenue will be the same uh, because they're when you bond, when you pay for those capital investments, it's the same financial and le legal funding requirements that are required uh, regardless of the, of the federal program selected. Uh, next slide. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner uh, Peterson of Multnomah County, what is the goal of the project? Will it pay for projects or manage congestion? Uh, definitely. So we know that it's uh, a balance of those two, and this is kind of our direction from HB 2017, the uh, legislation that was supported from throughout the state and across political lines. Uh, and it's a balance of that managing congestion and generating revenue um, and really trying to figure out the sweet spot. The spot in the middle is, is like Lucinda said, we're in the study phase and we're trying to work to figure that out. Next slide. So in the next four to six months, um, you're going to see uh, questions that we'll bring out to the public and you all uh, to help fine tune uh, the, the what alternatives we're going to study for the regional mobility pricing projects when we go into uh, NEPA. Um, and so the three big levers that you can turn that really uh, decide whether you're more managing congestion or generating revenue are where are the tolls located, uh, what are the toll rates for different types of vehicles, um, and then what's the toll rate at a certain type of day uh, for that segment? And so um, those are questions you'll start to see different scenarios and things we'll start to bring out for uh, public comment. Great. And Director Chris Warner with Portland Bureau of Transportation, how can you do the environmental analysis, the environmental analysis before knowing toll rates? Uh, so the environmental review process or NEPA um, through the analysis, we'll assume a toll rate schedule uh, to study the benefits and impacts um, from, from maybe a single toll rate schedule, because we need to run all the different environmental uh, pursuits, uh, economic, environmental justice, kind of down the line um, uh, to, to understand uh, what's the impacts uh, of that alternative, of that one specific toll rate schedule uh, versus doing nothing. Um, so that step, that assumed toll rate and analysis is really step two of a three-step process in figuring out what's the toll rate um, and then what, what's, uh, what's the revenue that's generated from that. So there were assumptions made um, back in the value pricing feasibility analysis. Uh, for those of you who are part of that, for those of you who are not, we can send you those documents along. Uh, there were two concepts, concept C, which is very similar to the regional tolling concept, and concept E, which was similar to the I-205 tolling concept. Uh, there were toll rates and revenues that were estimated for that for planning. Um, we're now in the environmental review or about to start that on the two toll projects. For the I-205 toll project, you'll see the uh, what we're assuming for the toll rate schedule and the estimated revenues in mid-2022. Um, and that's when the draft environmental assessment is published for comment. And then for the regional mobility pricing project, this is planned to be mid-2023. That's that draft environmental review would come out. Um, and then the final toll rate, because the toll rate then is informed by that impacts analysis, really is about six months. It's like fully locked in about six months uh, before tolling would start. Um, and that's because of the finan financing and, and the fine tuning of it. It's called the level three or investment grade traffic and revenue analysis. Uh, needs to be done to then fit the needs of the financial market and the bondholders. Great. And just before we start discussion, um, I feel like, um, Lucinda, did I interrupt something you wanted to add? No, I think that that was, that was great for where we are right now. I think this okay. is a good, uh, I think we have a lot to discuss on this one. So good. 
implementation i just go ahead and uh show of a hand or taking yourselves off mute and we'll uh just be a couple minutes behind on the agenda into the next section let's have a discussion here did we oh we do have a hand up yes mayor uh, gamba please hi everyone um it's it's maybe less about that specific thing and more about what i'm hearing uh from not only this panel uh broadly but from people outside of this room who are becoming more and more concerned and there's this <clears throat> fear that uh the decision will be made and baked before people have answers to the questions that are critical to them as to whether or not they're going to support it. Um, and I, I, I feel like if people understood that at different stages, uh, I guess, let me back up. I think if people understood or if it, I don't even know if this is true, but if it's not written in stone ever until the final decision is made, probably people are gonna be more comfortable. But if they feel like as we move along, things get written in stone and they're screwed, but they don't know yet the answer to the particular question, whether it's about transit or whether it's about how we're gonna come up with money for certain things or how we're gonna handle, um, uh, people trying to escape the tolling, all of those things that are making people nervous. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Am I, did I manage to get that? Yeah, I think you're, you're saying the timing of information and the decision-making process can be a, a concern. Well, and, and, and the understanding that it's, uh, that it, I'll be really blunt. The, the question people ask in their mind is, am I going to be able to kill this thing by the time I have the answer to the questions? That's literally, I think, the, what, what it's gonna boil down to. Fair enough, appreciate that input. And um, I've got uh, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, in context of the discussion here tonight, not necessarily about any of the responses of this last session piece here, um, you know, I. You know, I've been a person, whether I, you know, purchased some equipment or tried out an experiment or whatever it may be, I always said, show me where, where, who's got one or where can I go to go see it? Show me. And um, I think what's unique here um, is that uh, we are claimed to be the first area to be studied uh, for this level of tolling of all the lanes in a metropolitan environment. And it, it begs the question that if, if there was to be an, an experiment um, as such, you know, what metropolitan area in the country would rank towards the top uh, to do that? And I would imagine that that would be one where in that metropolitan region, there's substantial transit and alternatives and, and, and everything really laid out. So I, I don't think that the Portland metro region would rank near the top. Matter of fact, I think for the 14 miles of Interstate 205 that has no alternatives parallel to or around, and all the transit deserts we have in the, in the region, I don't think we'd rank very high. So I I guess my question um, or my my comment is I, I really think that the economic impacts um, somewhat beg the question that maybe we should be doing a deeper analysis, an economic impact study, because I don't think anyone was anyone's really talking about economics, moving commerce, right? Move, uh, moving goods and services, uh, the, the essentials, taking into account not just the urban metro region, but in, but in Clackamas and Washington County specifically, those rural areas that are on the fringe that are part of the commute shed. We are not looking at this holistically and the impacts I, I think are to be significant. So I just have reservations about this. Um, um, and again, show me, show me a metropolitan region that's told all the lanes, with or without adequate alternatives. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. So taking a look at the uh, the impacts on commerce, and I know we've got um, some limited time. Why don't we take our last comment from uh, Bill Merchant on this discussion, and then we'll 
move forward on the agenda. If you live in Clackamas County on the east side of the Willamette River, you have four choices to cross the river. You can go at Wilsonville, you can take the ferry, you can take the old bridge in Oregon City, you can take the uh, 205 bridge. Then if you want to get up a little bit further, you can maybe take the, the um, Selwood Bridge. But that's how people in the east side of Clackamas County can get across the river. And it's true the other way as well. If you're living on the west side of the river, if you want to get to east side of the river, you got to go one of those choices. Now, if you're in downtown Portland, you've got lots of bridges to go across. You've got lots of ways across there. But if you're not in the urban center of Portland, you really are limited in how you can move across the river. And any kind of tolling that affects the 205 bridge and other areas there is going to affect everybody who wants to get from one side of the river to the other. And that, to, to bring this out and make that seem equitable to people who are living on the east side of the river is gonna be a real hard burden. So I hope that uh, you guys can think about that and come up with some good arguments for why it's worthwhile to do this, to get from one side of the river to the other. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the discussion. I don't want to cut it short. So maybe in that time of an elevator pitch, uh, Councillor Nolan, can you wrap up this discussion? Uh, thanks, Scott. I will try. Um, I just want to put on the record that I don't think my answer, my question was answered at all. I was asking on the decision-making process between Section 129 uh, tolling authority and the value pricing um, program. I understand, and Lucinda can correct me if I'm wrong, that somewhere a decision's been made already, which that the I-205 project will be will pursue tolling authority under Section 129. And I am very concerned, Metro is concerned, that if we move forward with section 129 for that, we may back ourselves into having to use 129 for the um, I-5 expansion and bridge replacement project, which um, would not be acceptable to Metro. Thank you all for your comments. And uh, Can I just get a clarification? Mm -hmm. Can I get one? Um, uh, Councillor Nolan, when you say the I-5, you mean the IBR bridge? Is that the bridge you're talking about? I-5 bridge? A mile, of a, a mile of it is a bridge and four miles of it is I-5 highway on the surface. So yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. We had the, uh, the idea in setting up this uh, question and Q&A session, there would be more questions. So I think we're going to try to move on the agenda with uh, all of your good input and discussion. Uh, the next part is an update. Excellent. And uh, uh, just, just before we go, Garrett, we're just gonna try to compress this a bit. We've got the public on at uh, 6.45, but please go ahead and, and make further comments uh, on, the, on the last item on the agenda. Yeah, and I, I can be brief with the project. I just think Mayor Gamba's question was, was an interesting one. And we've yeah. been trying, because our thought was not to have all the decisions backloaded to just six months before, but to try to show that there are commitments along the way in, in these areas that people are really concerned about, about diversion and others. So that was our hope and, and why you're getting a lot of process answers today is um, here, here are when those decisions are gonna kind of be made along the way. Um, and here's our plan to get to them. Um, so that, that's the hope to kind of uh, address that fear, like you were saying. Um, but. Making that more clear in communication, I think, is definitely something to work on. Um, yeah, so I can do our, our toll project updates, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. So um, as Nick pulls up the slide, we have two tolling projects going on uh, in the region, like we've been talking about. The I-205 toll project is about a year, a year ahead of the regional mobility pricing project. Um, where the I-205 tolling project is at is it's just in the middle of uh, conducting its analysis of running those regional transportation models and getting down to what's happening at the neighborhood and intersection level. Uh, so to Commissioner Savis, to the questions that you've been raising about needing to get that more information, getting it to you, 
Uh, that's what we're looking to work forward and collaborate with Clackamas County staff and others to have that coming to you here in the next few months to the, your diversion subcommittee and to your other work groups that are happening there. Um, the regional mobility pricing project, uh, we're, in, we're developing that purpose and need statement um, and really setting up what should the NEPA analysis look like then for 2020. Uh, to 2023, 2024. So it's a really critical uh, next four to six months. Um, we have regional workshops that are uh, happening on November 9th and 10th. Uh, we would love to have you um, and others attend. Uh, so we have a flyer for that that's out now. Um, and uh, uh, let us know if you have any questions about that. Um, and then our next slide, our Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee. Uh, so at their last meeting, it was a really critical step. Uh, these foundational statements uh, were actually agreed on, not just by uh, the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee, but ODOT itself as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll send that document out now, but that, uh, that document, these foundational statements are now going to the Oregon Transportation Commission uh, for their November 18th meeting. And we're hoping that the Oregon Transportation Commission and EMAC and ODOT uh, can all get behind and support uh, the uh, foundational statements as they're uh, written uh, out of the committee. So uh, that is your quick update on what's happening at the projects and the uh, EMAC level. Thanks so much. I appreciate that, Garrett, and a fantastic job being this uh, five minutes early on the agenda. But I think uh, unless there's any <laughs> objection, we can move to public comment. Uh, you're all welcome to uh, take two minutes to speak to the committee. You can raise your virtual hand so the project team can unmute you. Um, and I believe we also have, uh, Nick, tell us about the dial-in option. Is there a star nine as well? Yes, for those of you uh, who have called in by phone, you should be able to dial star nine to raise your virtual hand, but we don't have any phone-in callers. So we do have a, couple individuals who have raised their hand. Um, looks like Les Poole. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, just a sec here. All right, Les, uh, you should have the ability to unmute yourself uh, and make your comment. Go ahead, Les. Good evening, Les Poole. I live in Gladstone, kind of general for the for the mayor. I've got a background in, in land use and material handling, a fair amount in transportation, but, but what I'm really looking for is an involvement and on the face of some initiatives for voting on various things in the past in the county and here in Oregon. Uh, obviously, I have concerns that, that I think are redundant. I need to, to keep it brief, but the, the actual cost for what it's gonna cost for continuing um, versus the cost if we toll the average without congestion pricing and what those tolls and what those costs look like. Um, I've heard numbers all over the map and the initiatives were quite high and shocking. And now if one goes to the website, finds that we won't be surprised by the cost and that there's an ambiguous statement how the tolling commission will generally set the rate six months beforehand. It's got a credibility. ODOT has a credibility problem. It was there in 2017. It's still there. People want to answer. Be straighter with us. And I'm beating anyone in the room, but the public gets very, very uh, uneasy uh, to overreact. Um, we take a lot of unnecessary friction and confusion. And uh, we're headed down that path today. So let's try to be more um, direct 
and more informative with direct and clear answers as to costs and will be. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Appreciate your comments. All right. And next, uh, Susan. Susan, I'm going to go ahead and give you the ability to uh, unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Susan Beard. I'm actually here tonight to comment on a different project um, that ODOT is working on. It's the Northwest Highway 30 Industrial Project that's happening in high, along Highway 30 in Northwest Portland. Um, I am a homeowner along Highway 30, um, living on Northwest 60th Avenue, have lived here for 15 years. And of course, over those 15 years time, um, have noticed changes in the amount of traffic along Highway 30. Uh, no surprise, of course. Um, and um, in 2020, October of 2020, I learned about the improvements that were gonna be made along Highway 30. Um, was pleased to see some of the things in the plan, um, but was very disappointed that there was seemed to be no consideration of the people living here out in industrial Portland. Um, there are uh, people along this street, including myself, that, that call Northwest uh, Industrial home and um, enjoy living here, um, but are recognizing it's becoming um, a, very unsafe um, to turn on to Northwest 60th Avenue. The, the, uh, along Highway 30, um, south of Saltzman Road, there is a middle lane where people can turn um, to head, if you're heading northbound, to turn um, up onto Saltzman and other streets south of Saltzman. But that middle lane runs, goes away, um, just a block from my home. Um, and was really hoping that um, during this Northwest Improvement Project, something could happen to improve. It hasn't. I know I'm almost out of time. I have appreciated hearing um, from Nick and from Matt on this issue, but Betsy Johnson suggested I come tonight and just let you all know that please consider the people who um, live along these, these commuter highways in your, in your plans. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, and next up is going to be Paul Edgar. Paul, I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, the ability to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Edgar. I live in Oregon City, and we're one of those neighborhoods or cities that are going to be heavily impacted by rerouting of traffic, diversion of traffic, much like was talked about. And I believe that uh, Mayor, Mayor of Tiger, Jason Snyder, just hit it hard and correct. We know diversion will flood, quadruple the traffic across the old Oregon City, Westland Bridge. And it's just the only alternative. And in doing so, it will kill downtown Oregon City. It will kill Highway 99. It will kill or stop Highway 43 and Willamette Falls Drive, it will be devastating in job loss and investment loss across the county. And you guys don't seem to fully understand the lack of equity, the inequity of what is being proposed that will hit this community in a manner that cannot be mitigated. You, there are not there are no options whatsoever that you can employ if you start tolling the I-205 corridor between Stafford and Highway 213. And please understand, this is going to cost thousands of jobs. This is going to reduce investment. It's going to kill a downtown historic city, the first city of Oregon, the first city of, in many mines across the West. And this will be what will happen if you're allowed to go ahead and toll I-205. And please don't underestimate what that means. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Paul. And uh, the last individual who has raised their hand is Lisa O'Brien. Lisa, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give you permission to unmute yourself. 
whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You really addressed the question, the first question that I had. So I really appreciate that. The second question that I have is really simple. Before spending all the money forming all these groups that you formed, why would you not put tolling to a vote of the people so that you know exactly how the citizens feel? That way you're not going to have to try to wonder or guess or do community engagement or all of these things that you've mentioned would be critical for equity. The people deserve a right to vote on this topic. Thank you. Appreciate your comment, Lisa. Do we have others, Nick, that would like to speak on the public? Uh, nope. Those are the only individuals that have raised their hand at this time. I'd just like to thank Lisa, Paul, Susan, and Les for uh, participating in the, the public comment period. Very much uh, appreciate hearing from you. Well, thank you, uh, Scott and Lucinda. That was a great presentation. We uh, rarely find that we have time to get through so many uh, topics. Uh, so it was great that everyone had some input. I want to thank everyone for attending. Our next meeting is in January. It sounds like a long ways out, but it's every other month. And, uh, and it's we have an ACT meeting, obviously, in between there. So thank you for giving and, us uh, Commissioner Rogers, back. could, I, uh, Here's could I steal a moment before we go? Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you all very much. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we asked in your last meeting about... Um, Monday, first Monday first versus first Wednesdays. And we did hear from folks who were proposing to start on a Wednesday evening schedule uh, in January, and that would be January, March, and May. So we will have had two Monday evening meetings and three Wednesday evening meetings uh, by May. That would be January 5th on diversion and equity, March 2nd on transit and transportation alternatives, and May 4th on revenue. So um, appreciate your participation on that. And we really look forward to uh, bringing up diversion and having a good discussion with you in January. Other statements, Lucinda? No, I think you hit them all. So thank you so much again, Chair Rogers and Vice Chair Savas. Thank you for hosting with us. Um, everyone have a great evening and we'll see you in January. With that, we're adjourned. Good night now. All right, happy holidays. Yeah, oh, thank you. you. Too. Yeah, that's right.